Karate friends, welcome to Classics in Color, your weekly dive into some of the ancient world's wackiest facts. I'm Mark Graves, and happy 4th of July. Today, we're going to be talking about how the Founding Fathers had this deep love of using Latin words and names for code names and nicknames and sometimes insults, and how one time one of those insults actually ended up costing Hamilton his life. So let's get started. So I first encountered this theme, this concept, as a kid. One of my favorite books was I had this uh, Founding Fr Father, Founding Brothers, sorry, by Joseph Ellis. I can see that it's a very well loved set of cassettes um, that I would definitely recommend, but it's a pretty big book if you get the actual paperback version. So in preparation for filming this video, I found an article called Alexander Hamilton's Catiline Obsession by Joanna Kenty. So that is um, a much briefer <laughs> version of what I'm gonna be talking about in this video. So if you wanna follow up, definitely check that out. And what both of these works touch on is how prevalent the classics were among the founding fathers, but also just in their time period in general. Classics was uh, the fashion, it was the obsession in law, in philosophy, in architecture, in literature. It was all over the place. It was just seeped into the culture and it was in the schools. So a lot of kids, many kids, if not most kids who went to school during this period would have learned Latin and then they would have read Virgil, read Cicero in that Latin. And because access to books was fairly limited, you might only get like a Bible and a Cicero, right? Those may be the only books you read, so you'd become very, very familiar with them. So many of the founding fathers are reading Latin and they're reading these texts and they're relating to these characters in particular. So characters like Cicero, Cincinnatus become their role models, their heroes, they try to model their lives after them. For example, George Washington's favorite characters from the classics were apparently Cato and Cincinnatus. So Cato is from the Roman Rep Republic, the end of the Roman Republic, and he famously fought to Julius Caesar to the bitter end. He hated tyranny and he wanted to preserve the old ways of the Republic. And when he lost, when Julius Caesar could no longer be fought, he killed himself so that he did not have to live under that tyranny. And then Cincinnatus is from much earlier in the Republic when the, the Republic was experiencing a period of uh, danger, extreme danger. They were uh, at risk. They went and they dragged Cincinnatus out of retirement to come be a general for them. And he reluctantly left his little farm where he was living to come be a general, successfully won the war, and then went back into retirement on his farm. So he did not stick around to play politics or to cash in on all the clout that he could have from winning a war. He just went into retirement and so George Washington found these characters both very inspiring apparently and he was not alone. Many of the other founding fathers looked up to these characters and others from the ancient world. So not only did the founding fathers love classical characters and consider them role models and occasionally try to give themselves the nicknames of these people, try to say that, oh, I am a Cicero or, oh, I am a Cincinnatus, etc. They also would write a lot of essays and articles and opinion pieces under pseudonyms. And these pseudonyms could be under any old name, but many of them are after classical characters. And if they're not actually names, then they are often Latin or Greek words. So for example, Benjamin Franklin uh, occasionally would write under benevolus, which just means benevolent in Latin, more or less. And Noah Webster apparently liked to write under the uh, moniker um, amicus patriae, which just means a friend of the state. And then finally, John Adams, rather pretentiously, uh, occasionally would write under Colossus of Independence. So uh, Colossus was the big statue that was outside the Flavian Amphitheater and that eventually gave the theater its name. So that's why we call it the Colosseum now. So again, just a little bit pretentious, but you can see there's uh, lots of these. I'm only giving you a few. And Alexander Hamilton is no exception. He wrote many essays and, and articles under names like uh, Pacificus, uh, Camillus, Pericles. And one of the more interesting ones, perhaps, is he wrote under the name Tully, which we think is short for Marcus Tullius Cicero. So Tullius, that little middle name of Cicero. And he used that name in response to the Whiskey Rebellion. So a bunch of Americans had gotten up in arms about a new whiskey tax because we just got 
rid of the darn Brits for their tea tax. And uh, there was a big debate in America at this time of, well, since we got rid of taxation, can we now tax our people? And Hamilton was on the side of, yes, we definitely can. And the people who are involved in the whiskey rebellion are terrible people. So he wrote these whole essays under the not moniker of Cicero explaining why they were so bad. So he clearly is just as interested as everyone else in using these terms and nicknames, even though he was a little bit late as far as getting the education uh, uh, that everybody else had. Uh, not until his teens, I believe, did he really um, get the the opportunity to study the classics like other people had, but it seems like he was eager to show that he wasn't behind at all, that he was on board with this just as much as anyone. Cicero was a particular favorite of many of the founding fathers. He was just seen as this incredibly eloquent and accomplished statesman, very virtuous, very intellectual, philosophical, everything you could want to be, right? They really put him on a pedestal and looked up to him. And one of Cicero's most famous accomplishments was his clash or his contention with this character, Catiline. So Catiline was someone who ran for consul twice, and consul is roughly the equivalent of president in the Roman Republic. So he ran twice and he lost both times. And apparently he was extremely frustrated by this. And allegedly, according to Cicero, he was plotting sort of a, a coup to just take over the government by force since he couldn't get it by the traditional approved means. And so Cicero wrote a whole series of speeches against Catiline saying every possible negative thing he could think of, that Catiline is a horrible person, he's monstrous, and that he's um, making all these plots to overthrow the government. And these speeches had a couple different intentions. One was to like intimidate Catiline and perhaps manipulate him into making a dumb move. And then also to win over all the other senators onto Cicero's side and not sympathizing with Catiline to make him just seem so horrible, abhorrent that they couldn't side with Catiline. They had to team up with Cicero. Now, looking back on this from, from our perspective, we only have Cicero's account. So there's no way to know if Catiline was really as awful as Cicero makes him out to be. Um, maybe he was, maybe he wasn't, I'm not sure. But the founding fathers all bought into this hook, line, and sinker. They believed that Catiline was one of the worst humans to have ever existed, just horrible, a horrible person that he would take over or try to take over the government, overthrow the whole republic, this uh, beautiful traditional um, state <laughs> for his own personal gain, just because of his own ego and greed. They just saw him, Catiline is the absolute worst. So even though nowadays to call somebody a Catiline just means nothing, <laughs> no, nobody is gonna get uh, mad or start a fight about that. But in the context of the Founding Fathers culture, if you call somebody a Catiline, them's fighting words. So apparently in the third ever election of a president in the United States, Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr tied. And so they went to the House of Representatives and the House had to vote on who's going to be president. And apparently <laughs> Hamilton started this whole letter campaign where he wrote to all the representatives he knew, trying to persuade them that, yeah, I don't really like Jefferson either, but he's the lesser evil. Aaron Burr is the worst. So here's an example of one letter that he wrote where he said, Every step in his, Aaron Burr's, career proves that he has formed himself upon the model of Catiline, and he is too cold-blooded and too determined a conspirator ever to change his plan. And then elsewhere in another letter, he says, Burr is truly the Catiline of America. So maybe a little bit melodramatic, but he clearly does not like Aaron Burr. And there's almost like a dozen different examples of him calling Aaron Burr or insinuating that he is a Catiline. And ultimately, it seems like he succeeded because Thomas Jefferson became the third president of America, obviously. So Aaron Burr is not only insulted, but he has a lost. And ultimately, he ends up challenging Hamilton to a duel. And spoilers, <laughs> as we all know, Hamilton ends up dead. So it's just a really uh, powerful and important moment in American history that for all the hatred and disagreement and vitriol that the Founding Fathers had for each other as they were trying to figure out what to do with this country, that every other time they managed to get along and 
just either like live with each other or actually find an agreement. But in this one case, they couldn't and it devolved into violence. And I just find it personally very interesting how these Latin terms, characters and names played such an important part of that moment of our history. Thank you so much for checking out this video. And again, have a lovely 4th of July. I'm going to be having s'mores with my family, so I could not be more excited. Special thank you as always to subscribers and to Patreon members. And I hope to see all of you again next week. Karate.